Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We come to the last element of this event about the What's Bangkok Forum 2019. Gentle remind one of you once again if you would like to see the rerun for all of the presentation and our guest speaker, you can subscribe to our YouTube on RISC and MQDC. That's showing up on the stage right now. And now we come to the final elements of the today's program, the panel discussion. It's my delight for to introduce all of the panelists up on the stage. Mr. Dacho Chering Topge, Professor Michael Steven Strano, Associate Professor Dr. Yok Chanan Bongsawat, Mr. Stefan de Koning, Associate Professor Dr. Singh Interashuto, and our moderator today, please welcome Assistant Professor Dr. Gandhi Leo Kairon. Welcome back. You hear, hear you all? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Welcome back once again, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be here to share the stage with the world-renowned individuals, scientists, researchers, architects, and of course, um, the politicians and uh, the policymakers. <laughs> so that's a compliment. All right. Um, what we have have heard in the past two hours. I have to admit, Dr. Singh and everyone, my mind was blown away. I never thought I can hear or see something such a future so near to us and it's so possible that we can see a lot of good stuff in our lifetime. Let me recap once again. We have seen a dramatic um, thought provoking uh, concept of putting into the happiness as a priority at the nation levels by his Excellency, uh, we have seen the development of nanobionics science um, in a chemical engineering side that can transform our whole planet and move in towards the well-being. We have seen a lot of life-transforming idea planned, especially for Bangkok and many other key cities around the world by Stephen, and of course at the individual levels that would bring up the best well-being for all of us because by your statistic, Dr. Yoshinan, 15% of the world population is a severe disabilities. I would like to welcome all of you once again. This is not going to be just a panel panel, but rather I would like to welcome your questions, your curiosities. I know you got a lot of you know, wow factor in your head in the past two hours. And if you'd like to pass me the question so I can relate to our panelists, I'll be more than happy to do so. But first of all, I would like to start with Dr. Singh. You're in the central of the stage, yeah? And you're going to end up will be the last one to talk in the stage as well, so be prepared. Dr. Singh, well-being. A lot of people talk about it. And there are a lot of meaning and definitions out there. We have seen so many levels in our you know, conference today. What in your mind about well-being and how can we extend for the greater good of our society and our planet? I think it's extremely difficult to define well-being. And that's the problem, that we cannot yet put our grasp, our hand on the word well-being. Because you can talk about wellness, you can talk about being wealthy, you can talk about being peaceful, have peace of mind. These multi-dimensionals is extremely difficult to grasp and to move forward. And that's why most people today are actually not very happy. I think His Excellency raised a very good point. Even in Bhutan, with the national policies, it's an experiment to move forward with this commitment to creating happiness for all. I think that's the reason why we are here today, to provide everyone with connecting dots and jigsaw to see what would be the potential of combining different fields, different knowledge, expertise, and probably inching towards wellness, well-being. And, and, and I think it's difficult for us as a research center at risk. We have been trying very hard to define what's well-being for the past years and so many definitions. And one of the definitions that we look into is gross national happiness in Bhutan. And I'm here today and really delighted to be sitting next to His Excellency to hear his firsthand, his thought, and his admitted uh, statistic that 
some people in Bhutan may not be all happy even with this national policy. So we are here today to exchange and probably try to connect the dots with all of you here today in the audience. Thank you, Dr. Singh. His Excellencies, um, I have a whole lot of questions to you, actually, to be honest. And obviously, by Bhutan statistic, I'm the least happy person. Housewife. <laughs> yeah. Work harder, sleep less, you know, you name it. But back to my questions. Um, I think Bhutan has very unique concept to drive and sustain the happiness of society. But think about a lot of you know, the world's index that we have heard out there, the competitiveness whatsoever, that have been written by the West, mostly, with all due respect, United States. Um, with that idea that lots of people around the world think that these index are, you know, like um, respectful enough to, to understand, but Bhutan go in a very different way. How did you communicate or work among policymakers or executives or leaders you know, in Bhutan and make it believe that our unique way is the right way to go? We, we are extremely lucky because of our kings. So, as I mentioned, uh, 400 years ago, the founding father established the responsibility of the government, which is to create happiness. And then 40 years ago, His Majesty, the fourth king, uh, he very clearly said that for Bhutan, GNH is more important than GDP. With that sort of umbrella guidance, it's very difficult to go wrong. And so, uh, for us, uh, His Majesty, the fourth king, said that Look, single-minded pursuit of material growth is not good. We are a young country, we are a small country, we are a developing country. And if we put all our emphasis into pursuing economic growth uh, alone, uh, it's going to be difficult for us. And so it's going to be bad for us. And this economic growth, while necessary, must be sustainable economic development, and this must be balanced by social progress. Uh, environment is important, culture is important, good governments is very, very important. Now all this is not going to make individuals burst with joy. So gross national happiness is not joy, is not joyfulness, rather it is contentment. People must be content. That is what lasting happiness is all about and to provide the conditions for people's contentment. People want good health care, provide health care. People want free and good education, provide that. People want to live in a good environment, provide that. People want to trust the government, so the government must try hard. People don't want uh, corruption, they want uh, a small gap between the rich and poor. So these conditions, the government cannot impose, the government can nurture. And that's not going to lead to people jumping up and down for joy, but rather giving people peace of mind and giving people a sense of contentment. That is so fantastic. It's a very powerful statement. Because we look back, uh, for instance, in our country, we do both in and out. We benchmark ourselves with an in that international indexes out there, and we try to improve from, you know, from inside. But somehow, uh, there could be some you know, problems and issues that we can't move forward. But then, can I ask you one more question? Well, there will be many more after this. Um, I'm thinking about, I have heard, you know, learned from survey, people become more, not more, I mean, become less happy, especially in the digital era. When the digital takes place everywhere, everybody gets connected somehow too fast, too furious. Has it changed anything in terms of the milestone or, or you know, the, uh, uh, the key steps of Bhutan to becoming the happy country? So again, at the government level, we talk about the conditions of happiness. At the individual level, I define my own happiness. And so we must be very careful on what uh, we are actually discussing. From the government's perspective, from the national perspective, now 
the new digital era. Uh, one, it is, you cannot avoid it. Two, it has certain dangers of isolating people and influencing them, uh, uh, influencing them to perhaps dangerous uh, habits. Uh, but three, uh, it has opportunities also to allow people to grow and to learn and to engage socially. So while the digital era can isolate, it can allow people to socialize also. All these, I think, any government would be looking into and should ensure that while we optimize the good, the dangers must be heeded. At an individual level, I think it's very, very important for individuals also to consider whether it is addiction or whether it is happiness and contentment, your engagement with whatever digital media uh, uh, you're thinking about. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your very insightful you know, thought. And um, it could be a way forward for our country and so many societies as well. Let me turn to you, Stefan. I love your presentation. I'm a Bangkok, you know, I'm born and bred in Bangkok and cannot believe that Bangkok has so much um, potential um, to go on into the future. You have talked so much what should be done. For example, the network canal, for, for instance, the, the road infrastructure network, buffer cities. In case that we have the future governor of Bangkok in this room, let's keep my mind crossed on that. Um, I'm not going to ask you what to do anymore. Let me ask you precisely if we're going to go on forward to the better future of Bangkok for the happier citizen, what not to do? <laughs> wow. Honestly, I never think about what not to do. <laughs> then I would be the worst architect or master planner in the world. <laughs> um, uh, what I think what is very relevant, where we can help each other, is, um, is think about city planning in general and put it on, on the agenda. And I think it is more important than ever because the scarcity of land is there and cities become bigger and, and grow faster. Um, so the, the challenges are bigger than ever. Um, what not to do is to neglect it. So I think uh, these kind of events can have a huge, tremendous contribution where we can find each other, discuss the opportunities, um, discuss the challenges and, and, and look at a way forward. So. Um, there are many exa good examples. I think case studies will do the work to start with. There are good examples of good cities and there are good examples or city districts uh, we can learn from. Uh, and they all, all have their own context. Um, yeah. Yep, we have to keep our eyes and ears open <laughs> and learn from the best. And yeah. then do it. Yep, thank you so much. Let me. Dr. Singh, are you you're going to say something? You look like you're going to say something. No? Okay. Professor Strano, um, we met just a couple weeks back, and I was sitting right by your daughter. She was a pr you know, she's such a proud daughter. I look at her father um, very lovingly. Um, I would like to ask you about um, your, you know, your innovations that you're working on. I think it's so fantastic. We talked about the light emission plants. I would like you to cast your mind forward if your innovation, your experiment come into in full effect. What, society, you know, what good societies can see out of that? I'm sure it's going to be tremendous. Well, that's, that's an open-ended question. I, I, could talk, I could talk for an hour on that. Um, so I, I ask, uh, uh, let's, let's just a few minutes. Yeah, really short, <laughs> short, short. So I think if we look at the future, maybe we can, um, we can think about what, what plants bring, bring us is the opportunity to um, access power off of a grid. So perhaps we can think about uh, cities that are a bit more ro robust. Um, not only does the total energy demand go, go down, but perhaps um, in, the, um, in the event of a natural disaster, you can still count on lighting. Perhaps you can count on other functions, uh, sensors. So, so I think it's a it's a small piece of, a, of the puzzle. It's a step in the direction towards uh, not just su sustainability, but maybe a more re resilient city. 
um, that's that's so awesome. Yes, don't I have a more specific have. question. Usually, my um, plants or uh, animals or us would have natural mechanism for preventing mm -hmm. things that would be injecting into us. And in this kind of research, how do you overcome this sort of because you are putting particles inside the opening in the automata, right, of the plant leaf? Let you read it. First. How did you penetrate? or putting particle inside the plant without, by knowing that, that the plant will not be accepting? How do you go over or how do you solve that particular problem technically? So it turns out that the science on this is emerging. Just like with humans and, and, and animals, there are, uh, there are materials that we call biocompatible and there are other materials that are decidedly not. And in, in my lab, we have um, instrumentation that we use that monitors uh, the health of, of plants. You can monitor the photosynthesis rate. You can monitor their carbon dioxide up uptake. You can liken this to, to a hospital measuring um, heart, heartbeat and respiration rate. And so you can, you can use those metrics and you can understand um, how, how the material is, is affecting a, a plant. And it's, it's, it's something that we measure very, very pre precisely. And we've, and we've used this to, to guide our material development. So we've rejected materials that we think start to in, inhibit this fun function of the plant and, and so forth. So it's not, so not all materials be, be, behave that way. If there's a thing that, that I can, can, can convey to, to, the, to the audience is that there are, there are um, some materials that are biocompatible, some, some are not, and it's an, it's an empirical question that we can, that we can investigate. Thank you so much, Professor Strano. You are so fantastic looking at you know, your story and journey along the time, and you share with us that you failed quite numerous times, yeah, and everything. here you are. <laughs> and here you are, share us your success story. But I would like to, you know, us to hear us further. What is the, you know, when you do experiments, somehow it, we have to fail and somehow to succeed. But I'd like you to look into the challenges out there. If you want to implement this, in the larger scales and help out people that you dream to, to help? What kind of challenges, number one, two, three, that we need to overcome first? So uh, like at the beginning of my career, I try to buy a lot of equipment, maybe like uh, from some company and then get connect and then get the people to see that this is possible. After that couple of years, like many people calling me, Seem like I give some hope to them. Okay. And my responsibility is if I cannot get this device to each individually as of them, I lie to them. Okay. So 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 that 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 going to be my responsibilities. So that's why like Dr. Singh said that uh, we we start talking. I start talking with someone I have like never think I gonna talk with them, like designer. <laughs> or architect mm. and engineers or something like we use a material like a chemical engineer to say that can you make that better than this can you make that cheaper so once we get into the group the new idea happens the thing you should not do is just stay into your lab mm. that that would be one thing that's why i start getting out the university like today <laughs> 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 and then i i try to talk with someone that I believe that would be on different spectrum with me. <laughs> like uh, the people I know, Ajahn Singh might not know. Mm -hmm. But normally both of them, if we talk to each other, the good thing will happen. Okay. So my recommendation is we should not just go into our peers. Start having some connection. So that one we call ecosystem. Some people from the US do it, doing this very well. They can have some area like MIT. If you just walk out your house, you can see some other people working on some of this stuff, but we not, might not be able to see some of this in Thailand. Yeah. So some, some of these things, I, I encourage that if you're the policy maker, try to make this one the system that can be shared. And, and, and also, I work closely with the doctor. Suppose some of the case coming, uh, the doctor might say that, I used the book, and then that would be 50 years ago. The people write this book, and then I still do the protocol one, two, three, four. 
because they have license, they would not dare to do something weird. I don't have license. Okay, I have just only ethical protocol. I I can do some something weird for them and write some of the new book and then try to say that this case we would not see the evidence, but let's start something. We would like this guy to be back to walk again. What equipment you want me to do? If I cannot do, I ask my friend. If I cannot do, I ask the company. So so that that would be the environment I think we should do. Zenka, if I want you to scale yourself from one to ten, I know that experiments, innovation is not a project type, but rather a journey. Um, along with your journey from one to ten, where are you right now? So I I, I think right now uh, I, I I can say that uh, it's specific to some disease. Okay, we also help the autism, we also help ADHD. I, I talked with professor before, and we we also help the person with severe disability. And we also help the people getting bad from the street. I can say that right now we can do like zero to five, okay. And half of them, we want everyone to fulfill and expand this one. I cannot do all, okay. Well, population is huge, but I want to transfer the knowledge. That's why we are in the universities. I want you to do. It's not me. If you cannot do, you ask me, and then we find this community, and would not keep that just only the countries. But it should be spread into worldwide, so that that would be the goal. Awesome, and ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you once again. I also welcome the questions from the floor. You can send me the SMS like analog way, like this. I will be welcome to, or raise your hands. Um, there will be microphone posts right there um, for two sides and the aisles. Um, so let me know if you like to exchange any idea or the questions with the panelists. Oh, I have one right here. Please welcome. Um, you can walk to the left, and please introduce yourself and all your organization, and address the question to the speakers that you wish to uh, to ask the questions. Good evening. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it has been a very nice uh, afternoon that I have been here, and I do have uh, to thank you know, all of the speakers for all of the information you have given us. But I would also like to have all of these audience who is who are in this room to bring back and help the community, because the community cannot move forward unless all of us, each and every one of you. We really don't need to be somebody important, but we do need to use our head and our two hands to help pushing the community forward. And this is called the cooperation. Now, what I'm trying to kind of uh, leave behind this, uh, this conference room is that it doesn't matter whether or not the, the doctors have the best bionic person, okay? We have the best um, condominium ap apartment, all of the beautiful parks, but all of the needy people, the disabled people are kept at home. We don't have the facility to help them move out the house and enjoy the public. And this is what we call that we are developed. No, we are not. We still have a lot to offer the community. Why don't we do something simple and have everyone have the same, um, have the, um, the same opportunity to enjoy this world? Why are we talking about going to the moon when people who are living in this world are still starving and they're looking for a proper housing or good food to eat, proper homes, clean water, and clean air. I just want you to kind of come down to the basic. And don't just talk among the educated people. Extend and open your heart, and open your heart to those who are less fortunate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your thought. It's very um, touching. Yes, inequality is still large, and we do have gaps out there. It's, our, it's everyone's job to help close those gaps. Dr. Singha, I think what she mentioned is regard to um, risk 
um, our center responsibility and our dream as well. So I would like you to take this opportunity to um, share with us just a bit, you know, the role of risk center that you are heading um, and the well-being of the society, not just for the privileged people or not just the elite one, but everybody, you know, around the world. As, as I said earlier, um, I feel very fortunate to be um, among the representative of RISC group. You know, um, we developed this particular center to be open to all. Even the design of the office itself, we have no steps. We want everyone, even those who may not have the ability to walk, can go through the whole research center. The research that we have are not limited to high-end residentials or advanced uh, skyrocket science. We do study simple behaviors of elderly. We do study seriously the physical being of people who are aging, who are not having strong muscles. So we do have multiple dimensions. And as I presented, the nine uh, dimensions of well-being, those are the things that we take seriously. And we want to create a real platform for everyone to benefit from. And that is something that I can promise you that that's the whole reason why RISC was found, to do research to serve the society at large. And you know, with, with what you asked earlier, what not to do, it's really difficult for me to, <laughs> to, to answer that question. And, but I, I was struck by a statement that we have been doing things as a designer, as developer, we are always thinking about human-centric design. And we are equipped and educated to think about human-centric design. Mm. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, when we focus on human, we focus on the worst part of us. We want to serve the ego in us. We want to serve the laziest in us. We want to serve all these things. And I was so happy that His Excellency is here because even you admitted that environment is not on the top priority. You know? And if you focus on human-centric design or human-centric aspects, this thing would never be resolved. So I would offer society-centric design or society-centric, because that's when Dr. Yochanan is start doing. That's what Professor Strano is doing. That's what his essentially is doing. And that's what uh, Stefan is presenting, that what if we all think for others, for society, and not so much about us as individual human beings, maybe we would have a chance of creating a happier futures. Who knows? And so I think, can we ask people to not focus on us, our, our, I would say not focus on our desire, but really focus on the needs, like what she was presenting, as opposed to, because human has unlimited want and desire. Yes, yes. It's hard to, to meet those expectations. Yeah. And, and oftentimes that wants and needs are not the same thing. Exactly, and they're usually not the same yeah, thing. Yeah. We always want something that we need less. <laughs> Stephen, uh, back to you. Uh, we have the question from the, the audience. I think it's a very good question. Um, is it possible to connect all the sewer, sewers along Bangkok Street to make a canal grid underneath every street and drain water into the sea? Huh. Well, if we talk about what to not to do, maybe I'm not sure yet. <laughs> um, so this is going to be what to do. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Uh, let me refer to uh, Dr. Singh also. This also touches upon the topic of thinking about us. So this, this question uh, is asking for a collaborative uh, approach, I think. And um, it is not the fortunate and the unfortunate. It's not them and the others. It is us. Um, and that's exactly um, what we try. I mean, the I'd like to refer to the project in Delhi. Uh, where the dra drain redevelopment takes place at the moment. If there's any challenge anywhere, it must be in the capital of India, the fastest growing city in the world, uh, with a lot of poverty. And uh, the opportunity of working with drains 
is that um, uh, you can actually get purified water out of it. So you, you first take very simple methodologies, like separating wastewater from uh, sewage water, and treat the sewage water with uh, treatment plants, and the rainwater you can purify even with vegetation. Very simple, simple basic methodologies. But I would not just try to divert all the sewage into the sea. <laughs> I would try to treat it even yes. locally. So locally you even gain a benefit from it and gain uh, the grey water becomes blue water. <laughs> and, um, and I have to look at the maps to see how the properties work, etc. That's kind of a technical part, of course, uh, to see if it's all possible uh, throughout the Bangkok Canal. Um, but that would be the start. So you see, you're saying that it, it is possible, but it's not the best solution. The best is to treat it. Locally, Locally. the sewage. Yeah. yeah. And, and it might uh, take a collaborative effort. Like, what is the business plan in the end in Delhi? It's a collaborative uh, uh, intent. It is an investment model. Uh, you, uh, the vacant land is partially for uh, released for property development. The, prop the benefits of property development for the government is put into the sewage systems and the uh, plantations, but there's much more revenue, so there will be public parks and etc. So it is kind of a circular business model. Um, and it works there. We can look at it if that could work in Bangkok. That's cool. That's awesome. We do have hope now. Yeah. To His Excellency, we have the question from the audience. Um, have you bring about or translate the Buddhism principle to the policy of the country? And that one's questions. The, the other question is, how do you validate the G and H? How would you just define it, um, either in your country and also speak out around the world, where we all believe that it's a good model to follow? So firstly, we are a predominantly Buddhist country our state religion is Buddhism, but uh, that said, we are very tolerant also because we have other religions, particularly Hinduism. And uh, so Buddhism, while it is, uh, it pervade, pervades through life in Bhutan, uh, we definitely don't adopt the attitude that Buddhism is the religion and the only religion and therefore every citizen must practice it or that it must be imbibed in every public policy. Uh, when you talk of gross national happiness and culture, now culture is very important for uh, gross national happiness. A lot of our cultural life has a lot of religion imbibed in it. So Buddhism, but also Hinduism. And therefore, uh, to enhance gross national happiness, we need to preserve our culture, uh, in preserving our culture, by extension, we are automatically ensuring that religion and spirituality is vibrant in Bhutan. When we measure gross national happiness, uh, the nine domains, one of it is psychological well-being. It's a very important domain. You know, to, are you satisfied with life? Do you have negative emotions like anger and jealousy? Do you have positive emotions like generosity and compassion and tolerance. And in that domain is also spirituality. Mm. Are you a spiritual person? And do you have an understanding of the spirituality that you practice? So there again, you have uh, a Buddhism or whatever spirituality you practice imbibed in the GNH framework. Now in terms of validating GNH, it is again the GNH index the survey that we do every five years mm -hmm. and the index we uh, publish, we means the country, uh, publishes every five years, that gives us an understanding of the trend of overall GNH, but also within the overall GNH, the trend of individual indicators to see where we are going as a society. Uh, in terms of information, when you do the survey, it is uh, the GNH survey, uh, all the information is from the people. Uh, we conduct interviews with the sample population and 
one-on-one -on -one interviews, the questionnaires, we go through the questionnaires, and that is the basis for all the data that is used in the GNH index. None of the government published data, the National Statistical Bureau we have, so none of their information is used because that is something that uh, is published by the government. Yeah? Uh, the GNH survey uh, insists that all the information must be provided by the citizens and not by the government. So again, that is a little a small check and balance to ensure that the GNH index is honest. I see. Um, yeah, I think I like that point. Who collect the data should not be the government. <laughs> or who interpret or the who data should not data. be the government bodies. And that, I think, well taken. <laughs> because we do have that survey around here, so we quite un don't um, uh, would like to understand, you know, how it's, you know. Can, can, can risk staff validity. go and collect your data for you? Can risk researcher go and collect data for you? Yeah, you can get someone outside. <laughs> Why not? Especially if risk is going to train to collect data in Bangkok. Yes, yes. Sounds good. We, we got a deal. Let's go. Yes, let's do it. Professor Strano, um, we have the question from the audience. I think they've got, you know, they might blown away by your inventions on bionic and light emission plant. They would like to know when will we get to see is implemented and rolling out in Thailand and the rest of the world and how we can help to make it happen. Yeah, so so it's, it's hard to predict when te technologies will leave the laboratory and, and Im impact society. I would say the, the, the light emitting plant is making um, fantastic progress, really rapid pro progress. I said during my, dur during my talk, um, already within a year, we've, we've already um, moved to a museum exhibit. So if you're in New York City, you can actually go by the Smithsonian Museum uh, of Design, and you can see a light emitting plant on, on display. And so I think that, um, I think you're, you're going to see um, versions of plant-based technologies um, uh, start, start to, be, to become available. It's hard to, hard to, to predict when. Uh, we have started a company that's that's um, co that's going to co commercialize these um, te technologies. I think the uh, the big question is um, how in in what capacity how the public will receive these these uh, te technologies. What the what the best form factor is um, for for human use. And so I think we need to take an empirical approach. I think events like this uh, where we're um, educating and reaching out to to the public and getting the the ideas out there and engaging your your, your response I think that that contributes to, to it and uh, ultimately I think all of these are, are empirical questions thank you so much his excellency I'm going to ask a follow-up question uh, professor we, we notice how plants need insects insects are fundamental to the survival and the propagation of plants uh, and then I also notice how insects are drawn naturally to light. You have a light bulb or a candle and insects just go there at night. How is it that plants have not evolved to create their own light in order to attract insects? And, <laughs> and, and are there any plants which even have a shade of light, you know, that retain light and, and, and let it out at night so that they have an advantage over other plants in attracting the insects? It's, it's a good question, and um, I wouldn't, it's, it's easy for uh, humans not to, and I don't mean offense by this, it's easy for, for humans to be um, arrogant and maybe second guess nature, but actually uh, natural systems like plants and, and flowers, they have thought of ingenious ways of attracting uh, insects, and they can do so with much much less energy than actually generating their their own light, and the the examples are are countless. And I'm 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 not a a, a botanist, but j just for, for for example, um, ferns. If you look at the leaf of a fern, it has um, it has photonic properties where it can change it, its color, and it doesn't have to generate its own light. It just it 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 can reflect light and and uh, mold it like a like a butterfly fly wing. And so nature has thought of what you're thinking about uh, what and uh, it can do so in a very low energy way. If all you want to do is signal, then the, the most efficient way is to take light and uh, redirect it in, in, the, in the mode that, that you want. Um, 
generating light from chemical fuel is, is, is an expensive uh, prospect. There are natural systems that do it. Um, I don't fault plants at all for not really prioritizing this. I think uh, plants are, are um, they're, uh, they're masters of adaptation and reproduction and real, they're, they're masters of uh, efficient resource usage. So it, you can think of it as we're just helping them, them along um, to, to direct just part of their energy for, for human use. Maybe it's uh, part of the story of, of human plant symbiosis, if you want to think mm -hmm. about it that, that way. Oh, anyway, hopefully I've answered your question. That's very exciting. Um, I believe we have questions from the audience. Anyone? Yes, go ahead. The microphone is right here. If you can please address your name and your organization and your questions, please. อยากถามว่าทําการสิ่งเปลี่ยนสิ่งเปลี่ยนแปลงในโลกเนี่ยค่ะเรื่องของสิ่งแวดล้อมเนี่ยเอ่อในฐานะธุรกิจหรือว่
can generate trust in their employees and the society. Mm. If the company, if the shareholders, if the management can generate trust among the employees, if the employees feel a sense of trust to their employers and to their shareholders, then I think it is important often by itself. In an age of rapid change, I think this trust is very, very, even more important. And so, while we are experimenting with GNH at a national level, this is why now we are experimenting with GNH certification for businesses. So that we establish a trust between a company and society, between employers and employees, be between a company and their shareholders. So that trust will form the basis for long-term contentment and happiness. Can I go to yes. you? A building uh, is more or less the same as a society sometimes, maybe. And um, I, I feel that uh, we o always do a survey when we realize a building, how people feel living in, for example, in, in, in a building. And um, the most important thing is that the, the, the buyers or tenants feel hurt, that they, they, they're hurt. so they're part of the brief, let's say. Uh, you can do market scans, that's one thing. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed what you see in our work, is we try to focus a lot on diversity Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and I strongly believe that if you, for example, buy a home and you can identify with that home, uh, it makes you feel richer inside. So it's not about the price of the, of the home or what's, whatsoever. So um, I think from my field where I work in, it's the diversity and, and, and the identification we have to focus on. Thank you so much for your lovely... Dr. Yoshananka, what's your thought? Yeah, from, from my perspective, I think when technology shift, uh, some equalities of the human right would be one thing. So I, mm. I feel like I'm very concerned. Okay. So uh, I talked before, like, if you're in industry, the company would be the mission of the owners and somebody that uh, take the part of that. But somehow your employee, that, that's uh, different goals. They pursue their own goal. So let let involve their dreams, their families, get synchronized with their work, and then I think I think we, we, we can develop the the better societies. That that would be the adding of my perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Singha. Your final word, please. I think um, to answer the question, which is difficult, what should we do? You yeah. know, in the business world, to <laughs> to when we are in such an environment that is not doing so well. I think we at least, we all at least, and businesses should be committed to solving the problems. We will get them wrong most of the time. We won't get them right. And yes, people appreciate nature and green space. We can try to add it in, but it may not make sense feas feasibility, in terms of feasibility. But if we all are committed to solving these problems, and get it wrong many, many times, we bow to get something right. And that is the, the issue that I was in a meeting with Kunti Paapon not too long ago. And we talk about developing social innovations. And in the process, we can actually make income, earn revenue from social innovation. Kunti Paapon is a group CEO of DTGO. She was sitting quietly there, and people presented that, you know, we should do social innovations, and so in the process, we can commercialize it and bring it back so that we can have revenue from doing social innovations. And you know what she said? She said, no. If we start thinking that we, we, we want to earn revenue from, from doing good deeds, we may start judging the ideas based on the income that we may get in the future. And that doesn't really solve the problems. And I want to leave you with that thought that if we are really committed to solving the problems at hand and not compromising it at the first step, we may have a chance. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the world-renowned individuals from researchers, scientists, architects, and also policy makers and the nation leaders. Give them a big round of applause, please. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure.
I can conclude that one thing though, that we don't see just the thing just the way they are, but the way they're supposed to be. Thank you very much. Back to you, Hakun Bai. Thank you. May I have a big round of applause to all of the panelists and our moderator. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite everyone remain up on the stage for the remarkable photo session, please. This is a smile of the well-being from all of the speakers, panelists. Before Dr. Singh would like to present a gift of gratitude, could you please tell us what is so important about this bag? Well, before we leave the stage, I have something for each one of you. Yes, no, you shouldn't leave yet because I have something spectacular to explain and it will be something that you have never seen before. With this token appreciation, we actually handcrafted them from dialysis bags from kidney failure patients. They have to clean their kidneys every day. And these bags are super clean and super strong, but they get used only once. When they get used once, they get thrown away. And the strength of these materials is equally strong as leathers. So we are crafting this bag for you to take back, to show this drive towards a sustainable world, healthcare, innovation, technologies, all in these bags. And we hope you take this back and use it, and it will last hundreds of years to come. And you come from the Netherlands, I'm sure you appreciate Freitag, and here's one from Thailand, the version that we create ourselves. And let me give you the first bag. Professor Michael Steven Strano. Associate Professor Dr. Yotchanan Vongsawan. Mr. Stefan de Koning. And to our moderator, Associate Professor Dr. Gandhi <laughs> Rio Pyro. <laughs> you can be our presenter. <laughs> Last 
part of What's Foreign Bank 2019, convinced by Research and Innovation for Sustainability Center or RISC, together with MQDC. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, all of the panelists, and our moderator. Thank you very much. For all the press who would like to interview all of our speakers and distinguished guests, May I call back His Excellency, all of the panelists, and our moderator back on the stage, please. We have one more shot of the photo session. May I have one more photo, please? And I would like to invite all of the management to join the photo session, please. All of the management of MQDC to join the photo session, please. Thank you very much for everyone for joining us all of this long afternoon making this forum a remarkable one thank you very much our four guest speakers will be meeting the press member of media who haven't already booked for this invited to contact our PR team here in the hall thank you very much Distinguished Gates, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the last part of our What's Forum Bangkok 2019. We would like to say thank you very much. All of the ideas and innovations today may be ignite and inspire all of you for the well-being to our human, mankind, and for the environmental well-being also. Thank you very much and see you next year. Have a good day today. สวัสดีค่ะ